You are listening to Exploring Sacred with your host, Denise Iwana Francisco, on the Temple Within Radio and Digital Media Network, giving voice to the sacred. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to a beautiful brand new day, and welcome to Exploring Sacred. The chat room is open here at the Temple Within Radio and Media on Spreaker. And of course, you can listen live via YouTube. Whatever it is that you prefer to do in the morning, do that thing. And uh, welcome. It's good to have you here with me. Here on Exploring Sacred, today we're exploring the realm of grief and grieving. And I'm just going to give everybody, good morning, Rob, give everybody a moment to check in with their body, to be comfortable in your body. And if you haven't done so already today, take a moment to breathe and breathe into your body and become settled in the present, in the here and now, being fully conscious and aware of this day. Good morning, Katie Battle. Oftentimes we go so quickly from one thing to the next, from sleep to being awake to getting right down to business that we forget to prepare ourselves for the day. It's a brand new day with infinite possibilities. And one of the most beneficial things that we can do for ourselves at any given time is to breathe and exhale with intention, consciously. And I believe that it's particularly important to be consciously aware of our breath and breathing and being alive and being aware to life when we are being present for grief. There are many forms of death and dying that we experience during the course of a human lifetime. There are, of course, those physical deaths to those that, for those that we love. Good morning, Angie. The process of watching or experiencing the passing of a human being that we have loved or that we have shared a lifetime with, to watch them pass from this physical existence into a non-physical existence brings grief and celebration for many, depending on how you look at death, celebration, going home, celebrating life. And I believe the same is true for our four-legged friends and our feathery friends and those of the non-human, of the non-human nature. Last night I was talking to Todd and he was looking at some Instagram photos and there was a beautiful photo that popped up of a Yorkie who looked just like my little Merlin. And you know, it's been a year, a year and one month since Merlin walked on over that rainbow bridge to join the great big wolf pack in the sky. And to this day, I miss him tremendously, tremendously. Of all the people in my life who have come and gone, who have been born and who have died, Merlin is the only living being that I have loved that I can tell you exactly when he died, the time and the date. Right. So this conversation also includes the passing of those that we love, of the non-human kind, the passing of relationships, the passing of who we once were, the death perhaps of perfect health, of the ideal life, the death of friendships. Grief comes in so many forms. And I do believe that perhaps here in the West, maybe more than some other places, maybe not all places, we tend to want to skip through it. We want to just push through it rather than to be with it. Good morning, Corey. My beautiful cousin, Corey, is in the chat room. Hey, Kelly Spencer. (laughs) Kelly, you and Corey need to become friends on Facebook, I'm just saying. Everybody should become a friend with my cousin, Corey, on Facebook. She's a beautiful human being. I love her. 
But talking about grief and being with grief, what does it mean being there for grief or being present for grief? It seems to me, boy, I'll tell you, in the past six weeks, the number of personal losses of friends has been astounding to me. The number of wakes and ceremonies that I've been present to for friends that have passed in the last six weeks and the number of friends who have lost children in the past six weeks and the number of clients who have lost their children their children have passed on in the past six weeks has been mind-blowing mind-blowing Todd said aren't you aren't you ready for a break from death and I said well we can always want to be ready for a break from death but that doesn't mean it's going to stop happening and so maybe we'll do a show about being present being there for grief Last week, or a couple of weeks ago, very dear friends of mine, their son passed away, and I called my sister Barbara to let her know, and the first thing that she said to me is, sister, there isn't anything that you can say to a parent who has lost a child. My sister Barbara lost her daughter as a teenager. She said, so I'm telling you that when you're there, there isn't anything that you can say, there isn't anything that you can do to make them feel better, just be there. Just be there. And that's exactly what I did. Day after day, just be there, be present. There wasn't anything beyond I am so sorry that I could possibly say. Sometimes for anyone in any loss, all we can say is I'm sorry. And when I say I'm sorry, I'm not saying that I'm sorry that a soul is lost to eternity, I happen to believe that death is the beginning of the next episode or the next adventure of life. But what we ache for and what is so painful is the physical, is the human, it's the tangible. That's what we ache for and we long for and we wish to have more of it. The spirit is set free. The spirit is set free, and we will meet up with that again, I do believe. That is my experience. It's not a belief. It's something that I know. But what about sitting with the grief? What about sitting with somebody who is in such a state of despair? Oftentimes, I hear people say, well, I don't want to go to the funeral, D, because I don't know what to say. I don't want to go to the funeral home because I don't know what to say. I'd like to be able to deliver a casserole, but when I get there, what am I going to say? It makes me too uncomfortable. Well, I don't think that there are too many people who relish doing any of those sorts of things in life. It is part of life. And so what I'm proposing today is that sometimes all we need to do is to be present, to just be there on the other end of the phone, on the other end of the computer, on the other end of if we're not able to be there physically present. We can be spiritually present. Our soul can be present. Just to hold the safe space for somebody to grieve, to somebody, for somebody to collapse into your arms, for somebody to be able to barely breathe and know that there's somebody there to resuscitate them if the grief becomes too overwhelming. It's amazing what our love is able to do to resuscitate people. To just be fully present. You don't have to say a word. And oftentimes the uncomfortableness, I believe, also comes up from any area or region in our own life or lifetimes or ancestral traumas where grief hasn't been fully expressed. And I think that we all have that somewhere in our lives. Grief that's not been fully expressed, and sometimes maybe it's our ancestors that weren't allowed to fully express grief. Maybe because of the social mores of the time, 
or maybe stoicism within a family, or maybe just from the shock and awe of that particular time in life that brought death. We carry those moments in time in our blood and in our bones. We all know that, the shock and trauma. So I believe that for all of us, there are moments of grief in our history, in our lineage that has not been expressed. And sometimes when we're passing through the grief of someone else or helping someone pass through grief, we can experience our own unreleased or unrecognized grief. You know, it was interesting yesterday. I, uh, in my name change, boy, let me just say, if you're thinking of doing a name change, just be ready for yourself because it is amazing what it takes to get your name changed around the world. But yesterday I was talking to a lovely woman by the name of Maureen at the TSA because I have to get my known traveler number, that account, the, the name changed on it. And the question always is whether I was at probate court or social security office and now with Maureen at the TSA, why are you changing your last name? What's the reason for the change? And I explained to her, well, it's about time that I take my husband's last name after all of these years. And as an adopted person, guess what? My family found me. She said, what? I said, yeah, isn't that marvelous? An absolute stroke of universal genius. My family found me. So that name King, that's my surname. So it's King Francisco. And she said, I have four adopted children, Denise. And so I don't know how I would feel if my children found their biological family members. I think I might be really disappointed and perhaps hurt. How has it affected your life? Did you find your parents? And we had this conversation and she said, you know what, this conversation that I'm having with you today really has opened my eyes perhaps to the importance maybe one day of my own children wanting to find or being found and how I'm going to react to that. It'll be something like a death, she said. And I would grieve the fact that I would be their only mother and that my husband would no longer be their only father. I would, I would have some grief about that. And we talked about that for a moment, that kind of grief. I was on the phone with the TSA Maureen, the pre-check lady, <laughs> getting my name changed for almost 25 minutes. And all of, maybe five of it had to do with changing my name on the pre-check. The rest of it was the grief of loss. Grief comes with loss, and we experience a lot of loss in a human lifetime. And at the end of our conversation, she and I, well, we were pretty good friends by that time, and she gave me some hints from Heloise about how to get my global entry number, perhaps a little more quickly, as I'm preparing to leave for Ireland in uh, four and a half weeks. Grief loss in that moment just talking about it with a complete stranger being present means sometimes we don't have a word to say it's our energy that says it all and it's the energy that of I love you enough that I'm just going to be present my physical body is going to be present and I'm going to clean your house and I'm going to cook food I'm going to do whatever you need I don't need to say a word but I'm going to be here for you while I wash your dishes as you're taking phone calls and welcoming the casseroles and the baked goods from people who also love you I'm going to be present I'm going to be present on the phone with a complete stranger she talks to me about her greatest fear as an adoptive mother the death of being the only mother that her children will ever know. I'm going to be present for that. And in that case, have an honest conversation. Sometimes being present for grief means we have to be honest about what it is that we're grieving. Hey, Cindy Lynn. Yeah, absolutely, Rob. Being fully present. Just being there. Being fully present, not half-assed present in a case like that, being fully present 
preparing yourself. I always prepare myself. When I was going to the funeral home for my friend Betsy a couple of weeks ago, I prepared myself because I was probably going to see her young children. And I did. And boy, when I saw her son, and he he's probably, what, six foot five now, and he came literally just almost running to me. Even though he's about six foot five now, I still saw him as somebody, you know, who was eight years old. Because it was the eight-year-old who came to me and hugged me and said, I was hoping you were going to be here. I was hoping you were going to be here. And I was present for that hug. And I was present for what needed to be in that moment. No different than when I'm present for a friend who's going through a divorce, right? The death of a marriage. Or somebody who's recently lost their job, the death of a career, or a mindset of who am I now that my job no longer exists? Who am I now? Sometimes we can't be physically there, but we can be spiritually, emotionally present. I remember when uh, Angie, when your mom, who I absolutely adored, was passing, I was in Texas couple of years ago. I was doing a land blessing down at a horse ranch for veterans. And I got the phone call from Angie. I couldn't be there. I was way down in Bastrop, Texas. But I could be there spiritually. My heart could be there. And I wasn't doing it while I was having dinner and conducting ceremony. I went back to my hotel room. I excused myself from the activities of that evening with everybody at the ranch so that I could be fully present as best I could from a half a continent away. It's about being present. And that's right, Nikki. Sometimes just say nothing, give a hug. She's saying, I'm not a hugger, but I will do it. We have to use our intuition and being present for grief. And the way in which people express grief. Some people, when they are grieving, whatever it is that we are grieving, some people are criers. Some people cry when they grieve. Other people don't cry in front of others. Some people do not cry in front of other people. And there are those that will mistake that for lack of caring. In some families... In some cultures, people are taught not to cry in public. Not to cry until you are alone. So learning that there are many faces and expressions of grief. Some people may be very, what we seem to think is together at a funeral home or through a situation in their life. And yet in the evening or when they go home and when they are alone, maybe even in their car driving on the way home or where they need to be next is when they are allowed, they allow themselves, I should say, to cry, to grieve, to scream, to throw a pillow, to punch a pillow, to do whatever it is that's necessary to allow that grief to become present. If you are somebody that perhaps grew up in that situation. For me growing up, if crying was punishable, it was punishable. And so it wasn't something that was done in the presence of anybody. And sometimes when that happens, and I know that there are others of you out there, when you do have the opportunity or you have no longer the stamina or the desire to hold it in, sometimes it can feel overwhelming. It feels as though we're drowning. We might say we're drowning in our own sorrow. We're drowning in our own tears. And sometimes then, if, if that has been the case in your life, it can be the smallest of things that can make the tears pour to come forth. A movie, a song that comes on the radio. Something that happens in the grocery store. And we are so moved and we're no longer able. Sometimes, if you ever had the experience, if you're not really allowed to express grief, 
uh, or anger in front of family members. Sometimes we'll do it out in public where we don't know anyone. And subconsciously, I believe, our, our built up tears and angst are saying, well, you don't know any of these people, so it's safe. You can cry in the Meyer parking lot because odds are you don't know any of these people and it'll be okay. They're not going to recognize you tomorrow, right? Ever had that happen? And it feels totally inappropriate because you're in a room or in a place full of strangers and the grief is overwhelming. So sometimes being present with grief doesn't mean it. it's always going to wait for us to be in a safe harbor. Sometimes the grief becomes present in places that we least expect. As I get older, particularly since 2004, the experience of a left brain stroke, I am somebody now who carries Kleenex. I never thought I'd be one of those Kleenex people. You know, I stuff it in my Indian purse, AKA my brassiere, right? Or up my sleeve, because I never know. I never know. Being present with grief is necessary, even our own grief. And sometimes we don't even know where it's coming from. Isn't that true? Cindy's saying, yep, yep, yep. Yeah, Rob, he's saying, I remember the funeral scene from The Ace where the mother forbade her children to cry at their father's funeral. Yes. The old adage, Corey, I know you understand this one. I'll give you something to cry for. You want to cry? I'll give you something to really cry for or cry about. And so we can learn at an early age that grief is a feeling that is confusing because sometimes we cry when we're angry. Sometimes we cry when we're joyful. Sometimes we cry because we're sad. Sometimes we cry because of all of the above. And so if you're taught as a young person that you don't cry, then all of a sudden anger and joy and grief can become one in the same. Gabriel decided to walk out of the room. Apparently he doesn't want to listen to this conversation, so I just had to go and shut the door. He's a very sensitive Jack Russell terror, terrier, terror. <laughs> There's a Freudian slip. Sometimes he is a terror. Angie's it, saying it was a true blessing for you to help my mom move forward. Well, it was an honor. It's an honor. Last week I sat with a woman who in the past seven months has lost both of her sons two of her sons in seven months. And what do you, how do you, you know, how can you be there for that? Well, you just, you're fully present with that. There isn't anything that I could possibly have said other than my ability, you know, to touch in with them in their new home and spirit. But to sit across from a woman who has lost two sons and a daughter, um, gives me ample opportunity to practice what we're talking about today. You know, the other day somebody said to me, one of my clients, they were up from California, said to me, Denise, I have a question for you. When you sit with people such as ourselves, their son has re also recently passed. He said to me, what do you do for yourself? When you sit day after day, hour after hour with people such as ourselves who come here because we're grieving, And I said to him, you know what? You are the first client in all of my many years that has ever asked me that question. What do you do for yourself? I'm always present for grief. It's changed over the years in, in the way that I am present because as we get older and we get more miles on the odometer, I believe that our compassionate heart either hardens, right? We become jaded to life or our compassionate heart becomes like the Buddha Hote and it, it gets larger and we can see the many faces of grief. And for me, my heart and my compassion and my adulthood has helped me to understand that if we're going to be present for grief for ourselves or someone else, we also have to nurture ourselves. Yes, Jill. 
Jill's mother recently passed. Beautiful woman. How do we nurture ourselves while we're being, while we're being present for grief? I'm so sorry for your loss, Jill. I know that there was tremendous love between you and your mother. How, do, how are we present for that? What do we do for ourselves? We need to nurture ourselves. The energy of grief is potent. Being present to grief, grieving, takes a lot of energy. It can be very draining. It's okay to be a little bit, here in the West we consider it selfish sometimes, to take great good care of ourselves while we are walking through loss. Taking alone time when we need it. Taking a nap, sleeping in, replenishing ourselves as we are being present with and walking through grief. Being present with it helps us not to numb it. A lot of times we want to numb the grief. And I think that we can all say there have been times in our lives when we have chosen to numb ourselves through the grief. And we do that in our humanness in many ways, drugs, alcohol, sex, shopping, gambling, too much TV, right? Zoning out so that we don't have to feel. Whoever it was, whatever it is that has taught us that it's not good to feel anything other than positive emotions has really done us a disservice. To say that we should never get angry when someone or something that we love has passed. That we should only be joyful. For me, that seems counterproductive to being healthy. Sometimes we can be angry. And I'm never shocked, you know, when I have a parent who comes to see me who's lost a child and they are enraged. They are angry. And they apologize to me for being angry. And I will always say to them, you have no apology to give, no reason to give an apology. Let's talk about why you're angry. Maybe you're angry at them for the manner in which they passed. Maybe you're angry because why did it happen so soon? Maybe you're, you're angry because it lingered on way too long and it seemed absolutely torturous, their passing. Let's talk about that anger. Let's express the anger. Anger is okay to express in a safe way. In a nurtured way, disappointment, it's okay to be disappointed. I think the question really is, do we take up residence in the anger? Do we take up residence in the anxiety? Do we take up residence in the disappointment? Some people will live in the towers that they build to anger and resentment and anxiety. They take up residence there or pity. And that is their shelter, that is their castle for the rest of their life. I believe that if we are present with all of those things and we allow them to move through, we're able to get to the next. And I believe that grief is a process. Usually it begins with some shock. And sometimes, let's talk spiritually here for a moment. If we're talking about someone that we love who has passed. We're not talking about a career or any of that. We're talking about someone who has passed. Sometimes we're not only grieving for ourselves, but we can also be grieving for the person who passed. The person who wished they would have had more time. The person who wished they would have wrapped things up a little better. Maybe a person who wishes they would have done things differently. 
Those that we, that we love who walk on to spirit are fully alive and working their way, I believe, to the realm of the of our ancestors who are healthy, who are illuminated, right? Who are in the ancestry realm. I believe we all, when we pass, are making our way back into the realm of the pristine ancestors of our blood and our bones. And we have work to do between here and there. Sometimes when we have somebody who has passed and they are grieving the passing of their life, the unfinished business, regrets, or just astounding love, astounding love, we can also feel their grief. That's the thing about the bond of love. We can feel the joy of those that we love. We can feel a lot of things that those that we love, if we are empathic, we can feel those things. And those feelings still exist for a time upon our passing. I love the other day, the medicine man that oversaw ceremony for the passing of my friend's beautiful son when he said you know for the first four days after we leave this physical body we visit those that we love we let them know that we're okay we let them know that we love them that they meant something to us and sometimes i believe that four days can be extended. I believe that those that we love touch in to visit with us for a very long time. But in the beginning, especially when the emotions are still so fully present on this side of the veil and that side of the veil, we can be present to all of it. And that is why being nourished, nourishing ourselves, is so important. I sometimes wonder if that isn't really part of why it is people feel compelled to bring food to someone who's grieving. It's a form of nourishment, right? Feed your body, keep you strong. But what about keeping the emotional body strong, the mental body strong, the spiritual body strong? What about that part? Next year, here at the School of Sacred Studies, I'm going to be teaching a course called Soul Minding. Soul, S-O-U-L, Minding, M-I-N-D-I-N-G. How do we mind souls before they incarnate? How do we become somebody who can mind souls while we're present on the earth plane? And what about minding those souls that are preparing to pass and minding those that have passed? as they travel the pathway to the ancestors. What about that? I'm in the middle of creating a manuscript and finishing up another book right now, a book of enchantments. That's getting ready to uh, go in for final edit. I think it all has to do with what we're talking about today. You know, some people, I believe, even in birth, grieve the fact that they're no longer in spirit. I believe that there are some that come to the earth plane feeling as though they're ready to be present on the earth plane only to discover, oh my goodness, that's right, this human experience is rough. Why did I leave my cozy nest in spirit? That place without all of the foibles of being human. I think some people come back too quickly, perhaps. And they grieve the loss of spirit. And they'll spend an entire lifetime wishing they were still in spirit. They grieve not being home in spirit. There are a lot of spirit souls in spirit right now that wish they could have a human experience at this time. And for some people, the end of this human experience is a grievous time because of the passion of being alive. 
Sometimes when we can no longer be present physically as we once were due to illness, there's also grief with that. I am no longer who I once was. I grieve who I no longer am and who I can no longer be. We need to grieve that as well. To sit with it, to think it about it, to chew on it, to let it run through us. And not forever. I'm not talking about, as my sister Barbara says, sitting on the pity pot ad infinitum. But it's okay to sit with it, to be with it, to go through the memory banks, to go through the scrapbooks, no different than we would and we do when someone passes from physical to non-physical life. To take a stroll down memory lane is a good thing. To build a house on memory lane is not a good thing. That is not healthy. But to take a stroll through the old neighborhood now and again in order to find the blessings, to see the blessings that we've carried forward out of the old neighborhood, That's a good thing, bringing the blessings forward, reconciling the burdens, leaving them in the old neighborhood once we've reconciled them. Sometimes we need a good therapist, a really great counselor, right? Nicole Fix, Terry Ruel, two of the best that I know, Anne Kremer. Sometimes we need maybe just a really good friend. Maybe we need a spiritual director or a spiritual mentor, a really wonderful family member. We can't always be present to grief alone. Oftentimes there comes a time when we need to to reach out. And for a lot of people, being present with grief means, oh my goodness, that means I'm going to have to reach out and ask someone to be present with me. Sometimes it's easier to ask someone that we don't know. It's easier to see a therapist or a counselor or an energy healer. Whatever that is for you, a medicine man, medicine woman. Morning, Cousin Donna. (laughs) Right? Speaking of that, last night, uh, some of the King cousins posted a, a, a photo on a uh, uh, text message threat of one of the sons using that aging app. It was, it, it's a great photo. He's a real handsome young man. And everyone commenting about how much he looks like my Uncle Buddy. And my cousin Julie came on the thread and said, oh my God, it looks just like my daddy. And everyone, you know, saying, oh my goodness, it does look like Uncle Buddy. And sometimes so we can revisit our grief just in moments like that. My goodness, that he does look like my daddy, she said. Everyone else is saying, oh my goodness, look just like your daddy. Only thing he's missing are the piercing blue eyes. And I was looking at the thread last night thinking to myself, there's one of those moments that just pops up of taking a stroll down memory lane. And for me, I look at the photo and I think to myself, I wish I would have known. What would my life have been like had I known Uncle Buddy? Had I known Uncle Claude? Had I known any of my aunts or uncles who have passed? What would my life have been like if I would have known my mother? My grandmother? My auntie? Corey's mom, what would my life have been like? Sometimes those are moments of grief that we need to be present to. And I know you all know what I'm speaking of. Those moments of what if. What would it have been like if
And it's okay to sit for a moment and to think about that and to chew on that. What would it have been like? What kind of trouble would me and Donna have got in all of those years if we'd have both grown up in Georgia together, right? What would it have been like for me and Corey and Johnny to be riding horses together? What would that have been like to share all of that? It's all right to ruminate about those things and to think about the possibilities and to grieve the fact that that will not happen. It did not happen. And to release the burden of that grief of that is not going to happen. And to sit with the blessing of, but here we are now. Donna's saying, maybe we can help. Uncle Buddy taught me how to make a bed. (laughs) I can share. Isn't that wonderful? I can just see us in October at the family reunion, right? (laughs) You in my hotel room or my room there at the plantation house. I guess that's where I'm staying, the plantation home. Helping me to make my bed. It's okay to visit those places. And then, you know, in the uh, Yorba tradition, the African tradition of spirituality, once we've really taken a look at the burden of anything and the grief associated with that burden, taking a look at it from all aspects, chewing on it, smelling it, touching it, then releasing it and carrying forth with the blessing. What is the blessing of the life that was lived? What is the blessing of what can now be? Yes, passing on good memories. Exactly, Katie. Passing on the blessing. Passing on the stories. Oh my goodness, my weekend with uh, Corey and Johnny. How many hours did we spend out at your pool, Corey, talking about family stories? How wonderful. I look forward to the trip to the Netherlands. I can feel it in my bones, me, you, and Johnny, and whomever else, taking a trip to Rotterdam, to Amsterdam, going all together to the Van Gogh Museum. Paying forward the blessing, I think, is one of the most amazing gifts of being present to grief. Because being present to grief means that we take a look at the burden and the burden of death, the burden of what could have been, maybe what we feel should have been, the what ifs. That's what we look at when we sit and are are present with grief for ourselves. Sometimes we're present to listen to our friend relay all of those things the burdens of the grief. And isn't it amazing? I watch this over and again in all of the funerals and ceremonies I've attended in my life. How we all begin with the burdens of the death and the passing. And before you know it at the funeral home or at the ceremony, there's laughter. You ever been in that situation? Where all of a sudden the grief and the burden turns into laughter and the stories of the blessings come to the surface after the burden has been viewed, tasted, talked about, touched. And anyone who's ever walked in on the laughter without having seen the expression of the burdens thinks, oh my goodness, what's the matter with these people? We're at a funeral, they're laughing, why? They've already been with the burden. And not that the burdens and the the heaviness of grief isn't going to come to revisit, because it does. Grief is something that ebbs and flows. It's not stagnant, it ebbs and it flows. And what I've noticed about the flow is, usually after we spend some time with the burden of grief, all of a sudden the blessings of comes forward the funny stories, the good stories, 
as Katie says, the memories that we want to pass forward. That's what happens. We can laugh about the good times. We can laugh about the times that are now laughable that maybe weren't so laughable back then. without negating what the burden of grief is, the loss, the sense of loss. Laughter through tears. Absolutely, Katie. Yeah. Being present even with the laughter. There's nothing like a really great roast, right, when someone passes and the eulogies start and the stories begin. And there, there is that, the tears through the laughter. Corey is saying, so true, Dana, so true. And we can look at that. The beauty of being present with grief is that working through it means that we're preparing ourselves for the next for what's next in our life. There's always next. Every time I talk about the subject of next in my mind, I can hear Bob Seger, right? Singing, turn the page. That page is always waiting to be turned, but we cannot turn it if we have not been present with grief. Grief can be like a paperweight on the book of life. Look at me, look at me, look at this page. You've got a paperweight here on this page so that you will look at this page. Will you read this? Will you sit with it? Will you be present with what is written on this page of your life? And this paperweight is not going to move until you're present with it. And once we're present with it and we read that page, we're able then to turn it to what's next. And our energy and our mind and our bodies are no longer shrouded and clouded by grief. There's no timeline for grief, by the way. Some people can move through grief very succinctly. Maybe they have great practice at it or it's the way that they look at life. And for others, it takes longer. And I think it depends on the relationship and the grief, the type of grief that we are moving through. Some people pre-grieve. Some people begin the grieving process before the grief is really fully present or the moment of grief. Some people grieve the loss of a marriage as it's being lost. You can have a pair of people that are going through a divorce and one person's been grieving the loss of the marriage or the relationship for years. And the other person is dumbstruck by the loss or dumbfounded, thunderstruck maybe is a better word, by the loss of the marriage. And the other one says, what do you mean you didn't see this coming? I've been grieving the loss of our partnership for years. Yeah, I'm sad, but honey, I've been sad for years, right? I think the same thing is true when we have a loved one or a situation that is passing, some people begin the grief process as the process of death is in process. And other people hold it together until the end. So there is no right way. There's no wrong way. There just needs to be a way to grieve. Sometimes the way in which someone passes can bring extra grief for those that are alive and living. If someone seemingly has passed from a horrific death, I think that the grief may be a little bit different than somebody who passes in the night, simply slips out of their body while they're sleeping. And I think that we may say that we also grieve the horror of death. It's one thing, in my experience anyway, when somebody says to me, oh my goodness, but they were doing exactly what they loved when they passed. They were right in the middle of, and they passed. What better passing could there be? And there's joy in the fact that the passing was in a moment of joy. And then there are those who pass in a way that in our humanness we comprehend as simply horrific 
and horrible. So the grief is compounded by the circumstances of the death. What I can say about that <clears throat> from my experience is that, that that should also be grieved. Why did they have to go that way? Why couldn't it have just been peaceful? Why did it have to be that way? Our mind, our brain likes to think about that. And we like to put ourselves in the place of that person that we love. What were they going through at that time? Right? Are you one of those people that wants to know what they were going through at the moment of death? Well, I can tell you in my 56 years of conversing with people who have gone through that process of death, and even for myself in 2005 or four, whenever that was, all those years ago, maybe it was 2007. Jeez, I've forgotten that stroke stuff. Anyway, the process of passing from the physical body into the non-physical realm is very peaceful. And what we may perceive as traumatic and horrific through our human eyes and the human experience that we are experiencing, it can seem as though, oh my goodness, to the soul who has passed, it is but a blink of an eye. Typically what happens, and I've talked to other people that have been have experienced near-death experiences, NDEs they are called in technical terms, they report to me that during the time of the airplane crash or the car crash, before being pronounced dead and then being brought back to life, they actually left their body. The spirit and the body have an amazing ability to know when there is impending doom or trauma and to separate themselves. We are held together by what some call the silver cord that keeps the soul connected to the body or the spirit to the body. And so the cord is not disconnected. But all of those pieces and parts within us that may feel the trauma and the drama, it is disassociated from the spirit. And that was, that was certainly true for me all those years ago. And anyone who has, has come to me in the course of my sessions with, with people that died in a tragic car accident or any other such tragedy says to me, Denise, I was already out of my body and I was watching. I watched it unfold. I didn't feel it. I watched it. Will you please tell my loved one that I did not physically suffer? And so I share that with whoever it is that needs to hear that this morning or whenever it is that you're listening. I believe that even people that are having a lingering illness, their body may appear to be in pain, but most often the body is not accompanied by fully by the spirit at that point or that, that spark. I hope I'm explaining that okay. So it can look as though the physical body, because maybe the physical body is, but the consciousness of the person is not experiencing it. The consciousness and the physical body is separated in those moments. Yeah. Being present with grief or for grief just mean, means just that, being present for it and all that it brings. Allowing the sadness to flow, the anger, the what ifs, the woulda, coulda, shouldas. Maybe you need to write about it. Maybe keeping a grief journal. Maybe keeping a grief journal. What you felt when. And open and honestly expressing I was shocked the first time I heard someone who had been married for 50 years say to me, I wish that SOB would have died 30 years ago because I would have at least had 30 years of being peaceful and happy. Right? That's keeping it real. That's keeping it honest <laughs> right there. Being present means keeping it real and keeping it honest. And even if that means you have to express it in a journal, that's okay too. 
being with the burden of, and then allowing the blessing. And if there are no blessings that you can conceive of, Maybe the blessing is that you can finally say out loud and to yourself, there were no blessings in that relationship. Maybe that's the blessing, being able to say, oh, that was just hell on earth. Glad that's done. There's a blessing, keeping it honest. Jill is saying, thank you for that, Denise. Having seen my mom's last two difficult breaths was difficult to see. It's reassuring that she wasn't feeling the way it looked and was already on her way to peace. Yes, Jill, and you're very welcome. Yes. I remember years ago helping my Aunt Mary Lou pass on. It was uh, 2000, wait, it was, uh, excuse me, 1993. My Aunt Mary Lou, one of my favorite human beings on the face of this earth. I always had a very close relationship with my auntie, loved her, funny, right? Still to this day, when I hear Patsy Klein sing crazy, woof, it's been 20, what, six years and I still choke up because she used to sing Patsy Klein songs like nobody else and crazy was her favorite. And being part of her hospice team, the family hospice team, I had the evening shift with Auntie. And she and I would talk about, you know, she had lung cancer. And she would talk about what she was going through. And there were times when she would share with me who was in the room with us. She would see her son, she would see her daughter there in the room. She would see her husband in the room, my uncle, and she would share that. And I would be holding her hand and I'd say, Auntie, can you feel me holding your hand? And she couldn't, she could feel my presence in the room, but she was so far ensconced in the other side that she wasn't aware of the feeling of me holding her hand. Her spirit was still attached to that body, but not to the consciousness of the feelings of the body. Only the consciousness of her soul. And so, you know, I did what, what we were called to do, the, the morphine suppositories. I did all of that kind of a thing. And I would always apologize to her, Auntie, I'm so sorry that I have to do this. And I know that this is embarrassing for you, but it's okay. And I would talk to her and we would have these conversations, right? And then I finally realized she wasn't even really present to what it was that I was doing. She was probably watching me. I could see her watching me from another space and seeing what I was doing with her body but not fully present to what it was that was taking place. And I remember when she passed, it wasn't, geez, probably not even an hour. Radio was on and turned the radio on and what came on? Patsy Cline, crazy. And I remember saying right out loud, good one on you, auntie. And I turned up the radio. Grief ebbs and it flows. I think the best part of being present is working through the burdens so that what we carry forward is the joy. When I hear the song Crazy or any other of Patsy Cline's songs, Walking After Midnight, He's Got You or She's Got You, <laughs> all of those, I don't cry out of a sadness except for the fact of the joy, of the fun. She had an amazing voice and she was so funny. If anyone could sing Patsy Cline other than Patsy Cline, it was my Aunt Mary Lou.
And it's okay that sometimes the blessing comes with tears. Those are joyful tears that sometimes we interpret as sad because it can no longer be. But it is. It's present in the now, only in a different form. Those that we love are present now. They are in form. They send us the songs. They send us the photos. They send us the memories to remind us that we are still very much connected. But let's be connected to the blessings. Let's be connected to the blessings. No one said that human life and human death and human birth was going to be easy. We signed up for it anyway. It's amazing the passion that we can find sometimes in the most sorrowful of times if we pause with it. We pause to it. Sometimes there aren't many blessings to be found. And again, the blessing comes in discovering that there aren't any blessings there to be found. Stop looking. Stop looking. Exactly, Rob. Yeah, for some people, death is a relief. The death of a spouse, the death of a relative, a family member. It's a relief for a lot of reasons, and that's okay. Boy, there are a lot of people who feel guilty about that. And that reminds me, just as we're going to wrap up the show here today, there's a magnificent thing that happens when we or anything that we love passes. Nobody passes alone. Nobody. That doesn't happen. We do not die. Even our little, my little Yorkie Merlin, the merm, did not pass alone. Even though there he was in Dr. Good's office in Todd's arms, there was more than that going on. There's more than that going on when we pass away. There's more than that going on when those that we love pass away. There is a gathering, a gathering of the ancestors. There is a gathering of heavenly beings, let's just call them, spiritual beings of light that help with the transition. They're the transition transformation team. They're the transition squad that shows up. And maybe for some, that transition squad includes Jesus. Maybe it includes Mary. Maybe it includes uh, the Buddha. Maybe it includes the presence of Mother Teresa whatever that happens to be, or another deity, right? The goddess Bridget. There's a whole lot that happens that many in their humanness don't see. One of the blessings of being in this body at this time for myself is that I do get to see. And they do get to share with me. Nobody dies alone. So if you are listening to this and you are still carrying the burden of not being present for the passing of someone that you love, you can let that stone go. For some, it is a boulder that affects the rest of their life. But I wasn't present. You do not need to be present for your loved one to have a graceful, beautiful, exquisite new beginning in spirit. Your attendance is not required. And sometimes those we love will purposefully wait until we are not present. Guardian angels, ancestors, creator of all things, ascended masters, they're all present. And Katie is saying, yeah, she doesn't see anyone. She feels them. Some can feel the gathering. If you've ever felt the gathering as someone that you love is passing or they just passed, you can feel the gathering. They're whole. And it doesn't matter how they passed. Being at my father's gravesite, I'm not talking about the Sarge here in Michigan. I'm talking about my daddy, Billy King down in Georgia. 
it was one of those moments where sometimes I wish people could stand behind me and see what I could see. Because as I was fussing around his headstone, cleaning it up and clearing it up, actually it's really very well kept by my cousins, which I am so grateful for. It was really clean. I just needed to diddle around because anybody who knows me knows that I'm a cleaner. Right? It keeps my monkey mind away from too much activity to be able to just putz around and clean. So there I was diddling around my father's headstone for the very first time this past spring, cleaning her up, and there he was, sitting on the grass looking exquisitely handsome in his jeans and a very crisp white t-shirt, rolled up jeans, by the way, and some loafers. Very tan, dark skin, dark hair, handsome. Just smiling, just smiling at me and my cousins who were there at that time. It was beautiful. The burden was having to be there and not getting to, to hug him in person. The blessing was there he was and I could see him, alive and well. And when I visited my mother's headstone for the first time in Alabama, just three days earlier than that, she wasn't present at that time, but my baby brother was, who died the day he was born. As Todd and I were putzing around, that, that did need some cleaning up. So we cleaned up around there and put beautiful flowers. There was my husband. He's so good, making sure that there were gorgeous, gorgeous silk flowers. Beautiful bouquet that I picked up because they're the cover, color of the Minnesota Vikings. I'm a Viking fan. So if anyone visits the cemetery for my mama, everything is purple and yellow and they're gorgeous, right? And futzing around with <laughs> my baby brother's headstone. And there he was, cute as a bug, very present. That was the blessing. And that's what I carry forward is the blessing. Being with it. the process of visiting the headstone. Because our loved ones aren't there. We all know that. They're not six feet under or any of that. The physicality is. But sometimes part of the process of being with the grief means that we go there and we touch the headstone. We replace the flag. We replace the flowers. We trim up around. That gives us sometimes for some people, an appropriate place to be present with the grief when you visit the cemetery or the mausoleum or the me memorial spot. My kids built a beautiful memorial spot for their father, uh, my ex-husband, uh, up on the uh, many acres up north that is family-owned with a bench and a beautiful cross and that's where they go to get to sit to be present with. To take a look at the burdens and extract the blessings. With that, everyone. Maybe perhaps, just perhaps, today might give us a moment to pause and think. And so in our own passing, what burdens do we leave? with those we love and what blessings do we leave? What are the blessings we wish to leave? And maybe then we'll live our life and pause and walk this pathway the best we can so that at the end, whenever that happens to be and somebody is sitting and being present with the grief of our passing, that the blessings far outweigh the burdens so that grief is easier in that place of recognizing that the joy is really all that's left. And lastly, two years ago, up on the reservation at a family gathering, the Tio Spaye, the Dull Knife Tio Spaye, Chris Eagle Hawk was the MC that weekend for our family gathering. 
the naming ceremonies, the honoring ceremonies. We even did some dancing with one another. But before all of that began, in the Lakota tradition, there's something called the wiping of the tears ceremony. And the Sarge had passed one year earlier. The Sarge had passed one year earlier. And so it was for me to be part of the wiping of the tears. And so the medicine man at that time was Richard Broken Nose. And there were four of us that were sitting all in a row. Brian Brewer was next to me. And one of my sisters was standing behind me. And Chris Eaglehawk made this statement. And I'd like to end the show on this. I love you too, Corey. Your loved ones want you to be happy. They want you to go on. Life without them will be diff a different life. But you must go back to your life and not hold them to earth with your tears. Life without them will be a different life, but you must go back to your life. Our loved ones do want us to be happy. They want us to go back to our life with the blessings of their life going forward with us. Thank you, everyone, for joining me today right at 1111. Good time to wrap it up. Get out there and shine, everybody, as only you can shine. Blessings be.